Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Gary Severinth with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. I'm very excited to welcome Scott Goldberg, Director of Leasing for Cirrus Consulting Group, and Eric Pook, President of Cirrus Consulting Group, as our speakers tonight. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it into the box labeled, have a question on the right side of your screen, and we will answer them live at the end or if it's pertinent during the program itself. This webinar is sponsored by Cirrus. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Scott, Eric, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it over to you, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Severance. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's uh, it's a true privilege. I've been looking forward to this now probably for over six years because the, the speaker we have this evening is someone pretty unique. And as we were just talking a little bit about the history, especially in this day and age, to have someone as hyper-specialized in a hyper-specialized firm, you, you find very few individuals that have the depth of experience the breadth of experience and if there's anybody that's seen it all and and been pulled into it all it's our speaker this evening uh scott goldberg is truly one of a kind uh scott goldberg joined us now 20 years ago uh the same year that he married just a few months after he married uh his lovely wife and now celebrated the 20th year anniversary and really brings a, an incredible business experience to it. And having done 20 years worth of dental office lease negotiations, I would argue that there's no one on the planet that has the same experience as Scott does, right? With, with well over 2000 uh, office leases negotiated, uh, almost all of which dental really puts Scott into a class amongst itself. And for those of you that own their, your own building as well, Scott's been instrumental with helping over the past two decades, multiple um, dozens and dozens of doctors really helping to strategize and think about long term transition planning, setting that lease up and properly structuring that agreement from both the real estate corporation and the practice corporation. So I couldn't be more excited to have Scott Goldberg on with us today. Good evening, Scott. How are you? Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the very nice introduction. Uh, not expected, but very nice introduction, so I do appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to speak uh, in front of you virtually this evening. And um, yeah, it's been it's been quite a ride. I've been in this business negotiating leases on behalf of dentists uh, for about 20 years now. It'll be 20 years this fall, and um, quite, quite a ride it's been. So um, firstly, just wanted to talk a little bit about Cirrus Consulting um, in terms of you know what we do. Uh, we are healthcare dental specialized a tenant rep firm. So we were actually founded by dentists for dentists back in 1994. Uh, our company has negotiated about 12,000 leases, dental and medical, and we have in-house legal leasing and consulting departments as well. And annually, we work on behalf of about 500 doctors throughout North America. Uh, also, we deliver about 100 seminars annually, and we do lecture at most of the major dental conventions. So in terms of today's agenda, uh, firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about why you, the dentist, are important to the landlord. Uh, I'll then go through some what I call shocking or common shocking lease case studies and how serious or how we address them. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about my years in the commercial leasing game, specifically negotiating leases for dentists. So firstly, what is a lease? Now, real estate lease, of course, is a written agreement between two parties where the landlord agrees to rent property to the tenant for a specific term length in exchange for payment from the tenant. That's the picture of the check here. Um, as far as you know, why you, the dentist, are important to the landlord, there's actually many reasons for this, and I'm just going to go through a few of them here. So firstly, dentists generally sign long-term leases. So dentists provide a consistent revenue stream for the landlord. They also reduce vacancy potential for the landlord as most dentists commit to 10-year lease terms and often remain in the same space for many years beyond that. Also, dentists make a large financial investment in leasehold improvements. So as many of you know, there's a high likelihood of remaining at your space for the lease term and for the renewal terms due to the large capital investment that you may have made in building the space or even buying a practice. And of course, this leads to a potential enhancement of the value of the landlord's property. <clears throat> 
Another reason why why dental practices are dentists are very you know important to the landlord is that dental practices are fairly recession proof. Um, so as healthcare practitioners, you're providing a necessary service to the local community. And dentists, of course, will require physical spaces to practice from for the long term. Uh, in this industry, you know, going through a pandemic, we know that there's really no working at home from home for the dental community. Also, dentists have extremely low rates of lease defaults compared to other tenancies. So a dental tenancy provides more certainty than other uses, especially retail uses. So again, as we went through the pandemic, we saw many retailers came and went, were not able to make a go of it, whereas most dental practices did pretty well, and many of them actually thrived through the pandemic. So certainly, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, a, a type of tenancy that is much safer for most landlords, of course. And long-term patient relationships as well, uh, and well-managed practices do minimize lease results, or lease risks, pardon me. So landlords do understand the value of having a dentist at their property, although truthfully, most of them will, will rarely admit it. Although I have heard from many landlords to say, who have told me personally, you know, we're really happy to have a dentist here. So as, as we've got some, you know, really an action packed evening for you and really about half the time is usually we want to keep things fast paced, some great case studies uh, and more importantly, how to address them. I know we had some late arrivals, so I'm going to push it a couple of polls because we want to help customize things and to help uh, get a good understanding for the room here. So uh, there should be a quick poll that pops up now just to basically describe your current situation. Uh, in terms of your current career, are you looking to open, relocate the practice? Are you, excuse me, are you to the stage where you're contemplating the next acquisition of the practice? Which Scott can tell you lots of uh, proper twos and don'ts on that and how the lease, as Dr. Tom Schneider says, is one of the number one reasons why a practice sale fails at the 11th hour is because of the lease. We also uh, are you to the stage where you're contemplating reaching out to the DPT team at Henry Schein, the dental practice transitions team, and thinking of selling your practice within the next five years? Uh, or, you know what, boy, have we ever seen a lot over the past few years? And quite frankly, doctors, if no one's patted yourself on the back for being alone as a business owner through the turbulence of the past two and a half years, it is truly remarkable. And the fact that the vast majority are back to pre-pandemic levels of production is truly second to none. Um, for those of you thinking that to stay put, right? I'm happy where I am. I just want to hunker down and whether the upcoming storm, inflation rates, right? Interest rates, et cetera, uh, or none of the above. <clears throat> so take a quick second to update what best describes your current situation. Uh, and then in addition to that, right, this is also very helpful. And we appreciate everyone that filled out the registration questions because we were able to add some great case studies aligned with some of your situations. Uh, some of the conversations and other components, and one that is one that creates a great amount of opportunity, yet also a significant amount of risk, or for any of you that are in an expired lease situation or known as a month to month or holdover type of situation. Uh, so if your lease, if you have a lease and the lease is currently coming up or has expired, right. again, that puts yourself into a unique situation that both you and the landlord right, can wake up one morning and 30 days notice and we're out, right? Where the time to build out a new practice today can be upwards of 18 months to pick up and relocate. Um, is your lease due in the next two years? We'll talk about leverage and Scott will share some best practices that, again, in the 20 years worth of experience, that two year out can be a nice sweet spot, right? To knock the landlord off their game right? and to start to be proactive and not to wait until the last minute when obviously the landlord knows the option to new deadline is coming up and beyond. Are you due in a two to five year and over five years or I own it, right? I own the own practice or for those of you that are coming uh, from, you know, being a current dental student or otherwise, right, to update to not having a lease. And then the third is, I know a, uh, a vast majority of you uh, reached out to request a quick consultation, right, with the team. Uh, there's a quick checkbox that I know a number of you were curious about rental rates, vacancies, uh, as well as, more importantly, what specifically is within my lease today. So just a couple of high-level uh, high poll questions here to give us a good sense of the room. 
and uh, again, looking forward to getting some great best practices. One of the things I'll also encourage is the Q&A sections. So we're going to have, and we've allocated a, a whack of time in the end, right, as you'd like, to touch on really digging into those type of questions, burning questions for Scott, right? I.e., is it a better as a mom and pop landlord to negotiate with, or how do you negotiate with a mom and pop versus a multinational, you know, real estate uh, corporation, a REIT, right? Or other questions, right, which is specifically about how or what happens if the landlord says no, right? Or, or why do I need someone with dental experience? We're going to dig into all of that and ask some of those top, uh, those, those top questions we get from, from dentists each and every day. Perfect. Okay. So on that note, right, one of the most frequently asked questions we get are the case studies, right? What, what happened? What was the doctor's situation, right? What was in the lease? And quite frankly, the did you know section is such a big component that, Scott, I'm sure lots of clients look at you with crossed eyes and said, Scott, how, how, how can this even be, be in here, right? How could the landlord get away with putting this in here? I don't even understand, right, how this could be. So, Scott, over to you to really share some of your top and most memorable uh, case studies here over the past right. year. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, first one I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, with regards to Dr. S in Atlanta, Georgia. So a little background on him. Uh, he's a, he was a 62-year-old dentist when he retained us. His plan was to work about one to three more years and then ultimately sell his practice. Uh, he was located in a retail plaza for about 25 years. That was his home there. And he had about a year and a half remaining on his lease with no options to renew available to him. So no obligation on the landlord's part to renew him once that lease expired. The main concern in his lease or his main concern certainly was what we call a redevelopment demolition clause. So in this situation, the landlord ultimately had the right to terminate his lease with six months notice if the landlord desired to redevelop or demolish the property. Now, the operative word here is desire. Just keep that in mind after when we talk about the results. But the bottom line is if the landlord desired to redevelop or demolish, they had the right to terminate his lease. There was a lot of redevelopment actually happening within close vicinity of his property, and it appeared that Dr. S.'s property might be redeveloped in the future as well. There were actually rumors going on amongst the tenants that were there that the landlord was also considering selling to a developer, and this was a big concern that was keeping our client up at night. Dr. S was really concerned that he would be unable to sell his practice as most buyers do require about eight to 10 years of firm lease term uh, without a landlord termination right, of course. Now, lenders often require a minima, minimum amount of lease term in order to, to finance the purchase of a dental practice. So without that term, it's very hard for many lenders to finance the purchase. So as far as remedies and results, um, this was, you know, interesting in that. So Dr. S decided that he was, you know, we, we basically requested that the landlord remove the clause in exchange for a 10 year lease term renewal at rental rates that were actually slightly higher than the market. So Dr. S was actually very open to paying a little bit more rent to provide him with some protection in the lease. Uh, accordingly, the landlord in that situation did agree to revise the clause as follows. They basically agreed to carve out that the clause would not apply for the next 10 year term which kind of fell in nicely with his planned, you know, his plan, his plan transition plan, which was again, going one to three more years with a year and a half left on his lease term. The landlord also agreed that once that clause became effective again, after the 10 year renewal, they agreed that they would provide 12 months notice to terminate when the, you know, essentially for the new tenant who would come in, because we have to assume that it would be Dr. S's successor. Uh, this notice period would provide a reasonable period of time for the tenant uh, to find a new space if that was necessary. And finally, the landlord agreed that they would have to take bona fide steps to redevelop or demolish the property as opposed to simply desiring to do so. So the concern with the word desire is the landlord could you know, wake up one morning and say, I had a dream last night that I want to redevelop the property and ultimately go to the tenant and try to terminate the lease. Um, you know, there might be other reasons behind that termination, but they could use the, the desiring to redevelop or demolish as a reason to get out of the lease early obviously a problem. So the lender agreed to take bona fide steps or to revise the lease clause to state that they would take bona fide steps to redevelop or demolish the property, which could mean putting together plans and getting city approval for a redevelopment. So ultimately the, te the clause had more teeth in it once we were through with it. So Dr. S now ultimately has a lease that is not going to limit his ability to sell his practice for its optimal value. So before we get to the second, 
lot of great information there. Just to unpack a couple of components that can be very material. The first, doctors, the best thing I can I, I can share is just for a moment, try to take off you know, the dental hat and, and your current practice ownership hat for a second and try to put on the hat of your buyer and start looking at the lease, your situation, the practice, right? Look at it through their eyes. And again, we get phone calls from both sellers as well as buyers to say, look, Eric, is this a good deal? What's the risks? And I'll tell you, one of the main concerns that is really spreading like wildfire, especially in major urban cities, are these demolition and relocation slash redevelopment type of rights. And, and Scott's bang on. The risks now that the banks are catching on to is that if there's insufficient term on the lease, the underwriters, right, the people that approve the loan will say no, right? And we see this from the big banks, uh, B of A or otherwise, that we work closely with, right? Term and options and lots of options can be great as long as they're transferable to the buyer. Right. A common thing that Scott and I see quite often are the doctor that says, oh, well, I'm thinking of selling in a couple of years. Boy, I don't want to renew my lease. I just want it to end and therefore I don't have any risk. Right. But the flip side of that coin is that suddenly, well, shoot, now I don't have any term. I don't have that predictability of revenue that I can give to that buyer, give them that key and say, you know, good luck. Right, to say, here's another 10 years worth of term and options to give that doctor the ability to pay back that one or two or $3 million loan. So term and options right, is a very different perspective of looking at the situations. And then as it pertains to relocation and demolition, if it's in there, well, I'd, I'd be concerned if I was the buyer, especially if the landlord only gave me two, no, two months notice to relocate. And reviewing a, a lease of a client in um, in Los Angeles who had reached out to us, was referred to us by one of the dental consultants through there, right? reached out to us, and it said, good news, the, the, the landlord can only relocate the doctor once every five years. And good news, they'll, can't, they'll cover 100% of the relocation costs up to a maximum of three months of rent. Right? So basically now, the doctor's going to incur over 300 grand worth of relocation. Right? and get maybe $15,000 back from the landlord. So a lot of great information there, but to really unpack it, the best guidance we can share is to start looking at your lease and your practice through the eyes of the future buyer. Okay. Start realizing that term and options and the well-structured lease right, is something that can transition to your future buyer and quite frankly, their future buyer. Right, Scott, how often do you see it you know, getting a lease all the way back to 1986 and has been transferred multiple and assigned multiple times over. Yeah, I mean, we see it all the time. And, you know, term is really, you know, I know we're going off on a bit of a tangent here, but term really is important for saleability of practice. And, you know, when you have, you know, you might have a landlord who gives you a 10-year renewal with two five-year renewal options. Uh, but unfortunately, if there's a demolition or a redevelopment clause with a landlord termination right six months later or three months later, it's going to make your practice very hard to sell. I mean, it might just become a chart sale. Obviously, you want to be able to sell your practice for full value, and and term is term is key. Term is critical. So Great. Nice, nice segue, Eric, into kind of my next case study, which talks about the relocation provision. Um, the situation here is uh, we were working for a forty-one-year-old orthodontist uh, who actually had a long timeline until her retirement, about twenty-plus years. Uh, she was located on the ground floor of a professional office building in a space that she had built out eight years prior. She had about two years left on her lease term, and she did actually have one five-year renewal option available to her. The main concern for her and her lease was that the landlord could relocate her to any space within the building, including the basement space, uh, which obviously would be much less desirable for her, especially considering she was on the ground floor of this, of this professional building. There was no requirement that the relocation space be comparable in size and configuration to her existing office. So the landlord could potentially move Dr. L to a space that simply did not work for her practice's needs. So um, I forget her exact square footage. I know it was around 2,000 square feet. So if you know the landlord could potentially move her to a 3,000 square foot space or maybe even a 1,000 square foot space. And obviously, you know, space size and configuration is critical to a dental office. There was also a potential uh, disruption for the to the tenant's practice if the if due to the relocation. 
So there, there was nothing within this clause that required the landlord to wait to hand over the new space to her and take back her old space until the new space was ready. So ultimately, she could be left with a major disruption to her practice, right? As we all know, it takes many months to build a dental office. Uh, it's a bit of a problem if you're, you know, you're out of your current office three months before the new office is ready. So major issue. Uh, as well, um, and this is kind of something Eric just brought up, the landlord was only obligated in the clause to pay for, or to, for the cost of the building up to the, un, based on the unamortized value of the current space leasehold improvements. So what that meant is basically, like the, the major concern here was that her space, her original build was amortized over 10 years. The original 10 year term was expiring in two years. So if the landlord decided, let's say after that 10 year initial term, if they decided to move her, let's say two years into her first option term, into her option period, the lender would not be obligated to pay for anything. So she would be out of pocket, you know, potentially a few hundred thousand dollars. So as far as remedies and results, um, as part of a 10 year lease renewal agreement here, the landlord agreed to amend the relocation clause to provide the following. Basically, they agreed that the relocation would only occur to another space of similar size and configuration with similar visibility on the ground floor. So again, this would ideally provide her with, you know, with a space that would work for her practice. The landlord also agreed to ensure that they would use reasonable efforts to minimize disruption to her practice in the event of the relocation. So it is, you know, fair and reasonable in my opinion that, you know, there'd be some sort of downtime between, you know, moving out of the old office and moving into the new office, you know, to move equipment, you know, reasonable downtime could be maybe a few days to a week. Um, the landlord here agreed that they would revise the clause to reflect that they would use, again, reasonable efforts to minimize any disruption. And probably the biggest item here was that they agreed to provide at their cost leasehold, in, leasehold improvements in the new space that was comparable in all respects to the existing office as of the date of the relocation notice. And in addition to that, they agreed to pay for all the moving costs as well. And this was all in exchange for a 10-year renewal. Remember, she only had a five-year option available to her. So this was key, um, you know, the landlord building out the new space was key and potential savings for the tenant of a few hundred thousand dollars for, for certain. So ultimately, Dr. L's concern about having to incur substantial construction expenses if she was forced to relocate has now been alleviated. And her concern, of course, regarding a potential disruption to her practice or being forced to relocate to an inferior space has been minimized as well. As we, as we get to number three, it's... Uh again, looking at things a little differently and, and how important the lease is, uh, you know, we could even do a quick little, little pulse check to, to know, right, if you think you do or do not. So there's a little pulse check that comes up here. Uh, again, if you, think you do have a reload or demo clause, right, give yourselves a, a, a thumbs up. Just be curious to know, again, if you've got a good sense of what's in there. If, if you're not sure, Right. I would put a thumbs down. So a quick little pulse check that comes up. We're trying some new features here. But, uh, you know, the, the good way of looking at this, guys, is the importance of dental specific language. And as you can tell, these leases were written as if it was for a Subway sandwich shop right? or a restaurant or whatever. Right? It wasn't written for a right million dollar, multi-million dollar dental practice. So the importance of explaining and covering as Scott's touching on as to why these things are reasonable or unreasonable right? it is a very justified argument to say that no 60 days notice there's no way you're going to be up and running and quite frankly doctors I, I, I'm not even worried about the lack of your production over those months two months three months six months it's the patient attrition Right. And in some cases, we're seeing upwards of 9% of patients that for each month that you're closed, they go down the street and they don't come back. So, you know, as Scott's touching on these, really look at it from the perspective of saying, well, I've got some standard form lease, but it, it doesn't touch about anything about dental. Yet it should, which is exactly why, you know, Scott's been, been, been hammering and screaming from the rooftops to really educate landlords of the importance of dentists, and more importantly, of the dental-specific language. So one is, is for sure has a demo relocation, right? And another three, uh, another 29% looks like uh, are not are unsure. So again, if you're unsure, there will be an option at the end for a review of the lease and uh, booking some time. Again, if you're not sure, if nothing else, better, much better to be sure. Scott, back to you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Right. 
So the next case study I wanted to go through was with regards to Dr. M in Miami, Florida. Uh, Dr. M, when he retained us, was a 56-year-old general dentist. Uh, his plan was to sell his practice ideally within about five to eight years. Um, he was also located at his, his current retail plaza for about 25 years, and he had six months until his lease expired with no renewal, no renewal options available to him. So the lender was not obligated to renew him whatsoever. He had no, you know, he had no options to renew. The main concern for him was his assignment provision. And, you know, many problems with this assignment clause, probably one of the worst that I've seen, you know, this one covered it all. So ultimately the first issue was that the landlord could withhold consent of the assignment request based on the net worth of the assignee. So if the net worth of the assignee, which is the person or entity taking over the lease from, from Dr. M, if that net worth was lower than Dr. M's at the time of the assignment, the landlord could simply say, sorry, but we're not approving the assignment. I think it's to be expected that a dentist with many years experience would have a higher net worth than potentially someone who's a little bit less experienced in buying a practice, which is typically, typically the case. So the bottom line is the lender could withhold consent and would not be considered unreasonable. The next issue that we had in this clause was that the landlord actually had the right to terminate his lease and recapture his space in lieu of consenting or not consenting to the tenant's assignment or sublet request. So the situation here was that Dr. M could approach his landlord and say, I would like to, I'd like to assign my lease to Dr. Smith. The landlord could say, thank you very much for, for the request, Dr. M, but I'm not sure if you're, if you're aware, you know, but we actually have a right to take back your space and terminate your lease. So, you know, how much is it worth to you for us to not do this? You know, maybe it's worth $10,000, maybe 20, maybe $50,000. It's, you know, this was obviously a key concern uh, because the landlord, not only would Dr. M potentially not have the ability to sell his practice, he might also lose his tenancy. So a major problem. The landlord, landlord's lease also required that the original tenant remain liable under the lease following an assignment. So as long as the lease was in effect, if Dr. M you know, sold his practice and let's say had three years on his lease, left on his lease term, he'd be, he'd be on the hook or liable for the remainder of that lease term Plus, he'd be, remain, he'd be liable for any future extensions of that original lease. So if that lease keeps getting extended further, he would remain liable, potentially in perpetuity. And finally, there was also a possibility in that clause that the lender could try to share in the proceeds of the sale of the practice. Certainly, when a dentist sells a practice, the dentist should be able to retain all the proceeds of the sale. So as far as the remedies and results, um, the land, so Dr. M historically with his landlord had agreed to five-year lease renewals. This time around, actually, he agreed to offer the landlord a 10-year renewal at a slight increase in rent in exchange for amendments to the, to the assignment provision or the assignment clause. Dr. M saw the value in increasing his rent slightly. So because of this, the landlord actually agreed to carve out certain areas of the clause that would not apply uh, if, the, if the sale or if the assignment, pardon me, was due to the sale of the tenant's practice. So what this meant is that the assignment clause essentially remained in effect with all the issues, but if the lease was being assigned over to another dentist based on the sale of a practice, certain areas would not apply. So the landlord agreed that there would be no minimum net worth requirement for the assignee or for the new tenant, no recapture or termination rights. And they also agreed to release Dr. M on, a, you know, on his liability upon the assignment of the lease. So this was actually a fair middle ground that was acceptable to both parties. Now pertaining to the proceeds of sale, um, the landlord agreed to revise the clause to basically state that only excess rent in the event of a sublease would be retained by the landlord. So what this meant is if Dr. M decided to sublease his space, and let's say Dr. M is paying $40 per square foot base rent to his landlord, Dr. M and he subleases space to me for 50 a square foot, that extra $10 a square foot would go back into the landlord's pocket. It's actually fairer in our opinion for the landlord to receive excess rent in the event of a sublease. Uh, the key here is, is that most dental practices, as, as many people know, you know, most dental practice sales do coincide with an assignment of the lease. And it's critical, of course, that all the proceeds of the sale do remain the property of the tenant who sell. Final result here is that Dr. M now has a much better opportunity to sell his practice without interference from the landlord while ensuring that he would have no liability following the lease assignment. So many key wins in this situation. A f fantastic example, Scott. My one, uh, maybe just t taking one step back on the slide, the the lease assignment, doctors. For those of you that have 
that 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 have um, you know looking forward, the typically when you sell your practice is predicated on two things. One is the future buyer getting approved for financing, and number two, the agreement of purchase and sale is usually or the LOI of the uh, practice purchase is usually conditional to the assignment of the lease. And it makes sense, right? How much your, would your practice be worth if the key didn't work? Right? Well, gosh, without the lease, it's worth the depreciated equipment, right? The, the nice A-deck chair from 20 years ago, right? Depreciated assets and whatever the, the current value of the charts are. So really what, what Scott's mentioning here is not, it's something that we see all too often is that this assignment section by and large is the most misunderstood right the the most skipped over clause because most oh lease assignment okay right but truly don't appreciate the fact that the the entire mechanics of the practice sale hinge on this one clause and yes right let me reiterate those few components just for asking to sell the practice the landlord came back and said, we can terminate your lease just for asking to sell the practice and therefore assign the lease, right? Could terminate the lease, right? So again, the landlord could say yes to your buyer, could say no, or could say no, and I'm terminating your lease and go directly to engage with your buyer. And again, how much more in rent could the landlord get from your buyer by saying, gosh, why would you buy from Dr. M when I've got the space, right? Why don't I just engage directly, pay me 20% extra in rent and I'll set up a new lease with you directly. Right. So, you know, uh, Scott covered through a lot of really important points here, but really be aware. And yes, right, you did hear him correctly. It is now becoming much more common that landlords are asking for a percentage of the practice proceeds, money, specifically from you, the seller, because the landlord now realizes that your practice sale cannot occur without the assignment of the lease. And one recent example, the doctor had to pay when selling to a large corp. Right, had to pay over $120,000 as an adjustment on close right, to the landlord just for their signing the assignment from the selling doctor right, to the new corporation. So uh, I, I just really wanted to reiterate that. I see there's uh, Dr. Severance and a few others have posted some questions, but we'll go to some additional questions here shortly. Um, Scott, all really relevant points, demolitions, relocations, uh, the ability to sell and assignment. And now, what do you mean personal guarantee? So let me talk about personal guarantee. So <clears throat> personal guarantee of lease. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about is uh, with regards to Dr. C in Toronto. Uh, Dr. C is a 32-year-old general dentist uh, who had actually been working as an associate for about four years. Uh, her plan was to open up a new practice in a street front retail uh, space in a newly constructed condominium building. <clears throat> her concern really, uh, her major concern, I mean, there are many concerns within the lease, but her major concern was the personal guarantee of the lease, which was ultimately the landlord was very happy to negotiate a long-term lease with a younger dentist with renewal options with Dr. C's corporate entity as the tenant. But this was all subject to Dr. C providing a personal guarantee. Truthfully, it's a very typical landlord request. Um, Dr. C, however, was concerned about her exposure if there's a tenant default. So, the, you know, the bottom line is if she's personally liable, the landlord could try to go after her personal assets, whether it be her car, her home, or her investments, in the event that she, you know, as an example, doesn't pay her rent. Her concern was very understandable as there is always some risk with starting up a practice, obviously comparing it to an established dental practice. So as far as the remedies and results here, uh, we were actually able to offer her, Dr. C, protection in two significant manners. The first one was a limited time guarantee, and the second part of that was a cap on the guarantee. So the landlord agreed that the personal guarantee would only be in effect for the initial five years, and the initial lease term was actually a 10-year term. And I believe the landlord's thinking here was that if Dr. C was to, so to speak, mess up, it would probably be during the first five years of the lease term. Um, from Dr. C's perspective, her thought her thoughts were, well, you know what, 
after five years, I don't have to worry about any personal liability. So she was agreeable to that as well. Uh, but the even bigger, the bigger win, in my opinion, was we also had the landlord agree to cap the tenant's exposure or the, or the guarantor's exposure, I should say, to one year's rent. So essentially, even though she was making a 10-year rent commitment, her personal guarantee cap was limited to that one-year rent. So if her rent in one year was $40,000, that would have been her capped amount, even though she may have owed, you know, we'll call it you know, $400,000 through the remainder of the term. So huge, I mean, a huge win there in that her liability really was significantly limited. So Dr. C ultimately was able to obtain peace of mind that her lease did not provide her full personal financial exposure throughout the initial term and the option terms. And even when the guarantee was in effect, and again, like, like I said, this is the biggest win, her personal exposure was still limited. It's uh, another great example of how can we, first of all, many doctors, we won't ask for a pulse check here of a thumbs up or thumbs down, but again, for those of you following along within your leases, not uncommon that the landlord might have asked one, and that could be under a personal guarantee appendix. That could also be found in an indemnification section, right? Or anything that really lists your name personally versus your corporation. Uh, and for those of you that don't have a corporation, right? Uh, again, you've signed it personally. So it doesn't mean you're off scot-free, but I think what Scott really reiterates here is how important it is that even if the landlord says, no, I want a personal guarantee, that's where things, the negotiations just start rather than finishing. And I think these are some great examples of different step downs that got remarkably better than what it was originally, which was a personal guarantee, right? Forever and ever, amen, right? With really no, no end date, indefinite, quite frankly. So again, looking at these, helping to, in essence, convince or share with the landlord why these are unusual and unreasonable. And more importantly, you know, as Scott's done incredibly well with, with the 2000 of these that he's done, is to really help sort of crack the code of what's important to the landlord, help reiterate the position as to why and what is deemed fair. And as Scott's mentioned multiple times, it's not a lose-lose or a win-lose type of situation. A lot of these creates a win-win, right? The landlord's very clear that they've got protection. That's, you know, for a full year's worth of rent, right? That can sound great to a landlord. And quite frankly, that can sound great to a tenant versus the other option, which is forever and ever. And even after you sell, right? Many will be shocked to know that there's continual liability there as well. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, so next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I've learned from my years in this dental office leasing game. And, you know, sometimes it is a game. Uh, so there, I mean, there are many, many lessons that I've learned truthfully over the years. I could probably come up with, with a list of 20, but these are kind of the top four that came to mind. So the, the first one is really start the negotiation process early. Uh, your time is leverage and positive leverage for yourself. It's best to start thinking about your lease a long time before it expires. So, I mean, ideally, you know, two years ahead of time, you should start thinking about things. You know, the truth is most, you know, most dentists, I think, get caught up in running the day-to-day -day practice and don't really maybe give a lot of thought to their commercial lease, unfortunately. Uh, but time is leverage. And, you know, the expectation, I think, for most dentists is when it comes time to negotiate, you'll approach your landlord. There'll be some back and forth. You know, it might take a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, and then you're done with it. The reality is sometimes it, it doesn't always work that way. You know, the landlord may not be so reasonable, maybe your demands are high, but you know, this is why it's really important to start early and have a backup plan. A backup plan could mean, you know, potentially looking at an alternate space just in case, you know, if things don't work out with your landlord. We know most dentists do not want to relocate, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you're put in a position where that's the best choice for you. So really start the process early so you have time to make the right decision for your practice. The next point is figure out what your deal breaker items are and ask for a little bit more, but keep focused. So I always tell, you know, I always talk with clients about this, you know, have your four or five deal breaker items, items that you really want to get or really want to achieve as part of your negotiation. But don't only ask for those four or five items, come up with an, another list of four or five or six points that are important to you, but not necessarily deal breakers. You know, the key here really is to try to avoid, you know, having your five deal breaker points and then coming up with 30 other changes to the lease. Uh, 
And the issue that I find sometimes when that happens is the lander may say, okay, we'll give you 10 of these, but unfortunately they're not giving you anything of value. So it really is important to focus on what your true deal breakers are. And like I said, ask for a little bit more than that, but just keep it focused. The next uh, lesson that I think I've learned really over time is that positivity in negotiation works. It's important to maintain or build a relationship with your landlord. So your landlord will probably be your landlord for many years to come. Properties do get, you know, properties do get bought and sold, but ultimately, you know, many landlords do remain the same for many years. And I find positivity does work. You know, you approach your landlord, you're, you know, you try to be fair and reasonable. You explain, you know, why you're a good tenant, that you're very much looking forward to trying to stay at the space for many years to come. And I find that landlords, you know, when you're reasonable and friendly with landlords, it often, you know, makes, I mean, it makes them want to deal with you versus somebody who's kind of bitter and negative and doesn't really, doesn't really seem positive about doing a deal. Ultimately, the landlord may not want to deal with that person. So being positive does work and really just keep it positive, as positive as you can. Sometimes it's difficult, but always put on that friendly face. And then finally, win-win results are achievable more often than not. So there's almost always a middle ground for each negotiation point. The reality is, and I'll give you an example, we talked, I talked before about liability after an assignment of the lease liability of the original tenant. The ideal scenario in that situation is that the original tenant, once they sell the practice and assign the lease, is released immediately. Most landlords do push back on that point because they don't know who, you know, they don't have much information or don't know who you're assigning the lease to, right? They don't have that experience with the, with the prospective new tenant. So a middle ground in that example could be, you know, the original tenant remains liable for a one-year period or maybe a two-year period or maybe even until the end of the then current lease term. There's almost always a middle ground for each negotiation item. And, you know, Lease negotiations, I mean, it's not it's not a situation where, you know, one party wins one point, the other party necessarily loses. Both parties can leave the negotiating table really feeling positive about the about the experience. Great, uh, great points. Right? I think the, the the piece we always try to reiterate is the three buckets, right, as Scott mentions. Right? What's the must haves? What's the nice to haves? And what are things that we're willing to give up in order to help obtain the must-haves? And, and that brings us to the next, uh, the next slide, which, which really touches on just some of those. So, so doctors, for those of you on your phones or otherwise, this is a great one to screenshot or otherwise, because you know, if you're not clear of what each and every one of these and what the financial impact it has to your practice, then definitely it's worthwhile a, a conversation with us and to point these out because these are, uh, again, just, just some of the many components that Scott and our entire team look at as we go through the process of negotiating or renegotiating the lease. So really, we've just touched on four of them this evening, right? Demolition, relocation, personal guarantee, and beyond. But there's a whole host of others. Uh, one of the suggestions that I would make as a great note for each and every one of you is to be aware and ideally insert a death and disability clause into your next lease negotiation. Now, this has to be you know, just put in death and disability, right? Very important to be adding specific language that, heaven forbid, if something were to happen to you or to your estate, right? It gives them options because... The lease, as some of you may be shocked to know, actually binds not only to your successors, heirs, executors, but your estate, right, is then responsible for the entire remaining balance of the lease. And there was a devastating example of a doctor who was in his early 40s, who built out a beautiful sex operatory practice, right, was an associate, but finally decided to open up his first practice. And unfortunately, three weeks prior to the grand opening, it passed away due to a massive heart attack. Fully built in practice, right? No doctor, no patients, right? Doctors, what's, what's, what's that practice worth? Well, the bank, right, collected from the life insurance policy. But unfortunately, then, the landlord said, well, now you're responsible, doctor, for the, the to the wife, Mrs. Smith, are responsible for the $9,000 a month, increasing at roughly 4% per year for the remaining nine and a half years on the lease, right? So the reason why, you know, Scott and I and others are so passionate about this is have the doctor had someone in their corner professionally rather than just, you know, signing it on the trunk of a car uh, of, of the lease agreement, 
right? But having someone really fighting for tooth and nail for each and every one of these clauses, the death and disability could have been a fantastic additional component there as well. Scott, anything to add on death and disability or any of these others that yeah. tend to be? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you covered death and disability and the importance of it. Um, you know, the ideal scenario, I think, with death and disability is that you assign your lease as opposed to terminating the lease, you know, but it's nice to have that clause in there because it really is the landlord providing you with, I'll call it free insurance almost, right? It's 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 the ability to terminate the lease early in, in case something catastrophic happens to you. And we never know in life, obviously. So it is it is a nice, you know, it is a nice to have in a lease, uh, certainly. Uh, you know, one of the other things that jumps out on the page here is the surrender provision. So there's a possibility if you were surrender, what, what we mean surrender is like the condition you have to leave your space if you were to vacate it or like once the lease expires. And there's a possibility that the landlord could make you, you know, take out all the leasehold improvements, which could be quite costly. And not only that, you know, turn it back into the original condition that you received it in. So we could be, you know, we could be talking about tens of thousands of dollars in surrender costs which most dentists don't think about. Now, again, it doesn't become an issue really for you if you end up selling your practice, but it could become an issue for the next the next dentist who takes over. Um, you know, looking at the list here, I'm, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, we talked about personal guarantees. Uh, holdover, I'm not sure, or overholding, that's a situation where if a tenant remains in their space after the lease has expired, there are some commercial leases that allow the landlord to charge 200% rent or even 300% rent, which I've seen, um, based on the then current rental rates that the tenant is paying when the lease expires. You know, it's fair and reasonable, I think, for the landlord to charge some sort of fee if the, if the tenant's lease has expired and the lease has not been renewed. But, you know, sometimes I think it's a bit of an overreach for the landlord to charge 200 or 300%. So, you know, generally landlords are, are you know, open to reducing that percentage of, of a holdover rent. So and these that, are... And and, and just on the holdover piece, a lot of doctors are surprised that that they could be backbilled, right? If they've been a month to month for 12 months, 24 months or otherwise, right? There, there's could happen. Be, right? If there's no limitations can be a, a specific concern. Scott, one question we just had come through that's that's relevant to this is a lot of uh, one question about sort of pre and post pandemic. Yeah. Right and language changes, and you get the force majeure. Or what else happened? And doctors, and what happens if they just walked away? And what do you mean I can't walk away? Because I, I have to pay the demolition fees. Scott, do you want to touch on again, and you know, just in general about sort of pre and post what you've noticed? From yeah. The so it's interesting. I mean, pandemic. You know, I mean, it really came out of nowhere, right? All of a sudden, dental offices were closed. You know, in some places it was a few weeks, some places a few months. The Landlords learn pretty quickly um, how to deal with this. So many of them, you know, generally a force measure clause or, you know, basically gives the tenant and the landlord, not in, all, not in every situation, but mostly the rights to not comply with the lease uh, for a period of time that, you know, if something happens that is outside of their control, which could include a pandemic. But almost always the force measure clause states that it doesn't apply to financial components. So the rent would still have to be paid. So after the pandemic hit and we were trying to renegotiate these leases or negotiate new leases, we tried to put in clauses where it would also apply to rent. Landlords got smart very quickly, um, especially the larger landlords, to not agree to that. Uh, some of them even wrote in sections into their lease to say that, you know, there would be, you know, it, it was actually very specific that there would actually be no rent abatement necessarily in the event of a closure due, due to a, a health emergency or a pandemic. So landlords became very smart. I found sometimes with the smaller landlords who didn't really understand this, we were able to kind of push push this clause through where the rent would abate. But most landlords kind of caught on very quickly, you know, generally within the first month or two. Yeah. And, you know, and there's also and still to this day, right, we still want to fight for those of you thinking of buying or building or expanding. Right. We want to give yourself as much runway, let it be a fixturing period or a delayed commencement date. You want just as many months to not impact cash flow, especially if there's unforeseen delays. So while I wouldn't consider it to the to the doctor asking the question, I wouldn't consider that a necessarily a sort of pre-imposed COVID, but just global supply chain, silicon shortages, et cetera. You know, the more we can do to spread that story of, well, what's next? Is it, you know, Omicron or as my kids call it, Megatron, whatever is coming through next, right? What can we do to make sure that we've got as much protection there as possible? Um, before we go to the next one, there's another one from Dr. R. 
Uh, our trip, Scott, our triple net lease is typical when negotiating a new lease with an existing landlord. So I would assume here that the doctor might be in a gross lease, which uh, typically means one set rate, everything's yeah. included. And it looks like either a new landlord or, or at least an existing landlord has suddenly said, hey, maybe I can get more money by doing a triple net, which is base rent plus, 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 plus. Correct. So um, very typical today. It's interesting. Again, again, I've done this for 20 years. I think when I started off, I saw many more gross leases. Uh, but over time, and I'd say probably over the last 15 years or so, triple net is, has pretty much become the standard for, for most commercial leases. Sometimes we have what we call like a semi-gross lease, which is where there's a base year for the expenses. So the base rent in year one includes all the expenses, all the triple net. And then the tenant pays their proportionate share of the increases over and above the the original year's amount of triple net going forward, uh, but triple nets triple net is you know certainly in my mind the most common lease that I deal with on a daily basis, um, and it's not surprising. I mean, I find with with gross leases, you know, periodically most landlords who are willing to do a gross lease are probably charging the tenant more triple net within that gross lease amount, that gross rent amount, than what the tenant would be paying on a triple net lease. But triple net, in my opinion, is probably the fairest way to do it, and really is the commercial standard today. And, and just to add, Dr. R, I would be certainly worthwhile, we'll pull it up in a moment, but uh, to have the lease reviewed, because it is, it is a great element for negotiating in one of the seven or more financial variables, you know, base rent, annual increase, common area maintenance, fixed rate, free rent, tenant improvement allowance, landlord work, et cetera, right? Depending on the situation are just some of the variables where there's little valves that, you know, Scott can adjust and move to help ensure that it's aligned to your long-term horizon as well as what's most important to you and to ensure that the landlord's not using it as a revenue generating opportunity. So it is negotiable. We've got a great uh, blog post that touches on what's reasonable, what's not in terms of management fees and you know why should you be paying for you know mortgage fees or mortgage interest or you know legal fees for an empty suite or brokerage fees for an empty suite when it really has nothing to do with you. So, you know, again, just one of the main components that if they are going to put something in front of you, it doesn't it, it doesn't preclude you at all. Quite frankly, it reopens a negotiation to say, look, if you're asking for something new, then here's what I think is fair here. That could be things unlikely, but things such as a cam cap. Right. Dr. Uh, Dr. R, if you're concerned with that. Right. Um, while difficult because landlords don't know and don't want to be backed into, you know, a, a cap of sorts. There are other different tools or spreading things out over the useful life, other ways of help, uh, helping to reduce the financial impact of those triple net type of fees. So as we really look forward here, and great questions, uh, feel free to keep throwing those in and we'll, we'll cover them as we go. But as we uh, really look to now, what's the solution here? This is the Scott Wheel of Success. I'm renaming it for you, Scott. Um, but, you know, really in terms of guidance, Scott, when looking at the process, uh, touch base, if you will, on the inf documentation. So if the doctor is now saying, you know, I'm now looking through the filing cabinets and, and what, what really, what does the doctor need as a checklist? And what's some of the first things you look at and make sure you have even before you schedule a, a call with the client? Yeah. So when I receive a new file, I mean, the first thing I look at is I, I make sure that we have all the documentation. So it is possible, you know, many dentists who have been in the space for 25, 30 years, they may have signed their, their, their original lease 30 years prior and have done, you know, three or four renewal documents. So it's important that we have all the documentation. We don't want to be missing a piece of the puzzle. So I make sure, you know, once I get that new file, I go through the documents to see what, what's been sent over to us and make sure that we have fully signed agreements. So signed by landlord and tenant, which is critical. Because ultimately, if I'm looking at a document that is not signed, it's really just a piece of paper. So it's important to have all the documentation for all, you know, from when that original lease was signed, all the renewal documents going forward. And, and that could include uh, sometimes landlords send over, um, you know, stopple certificates to the tenant to sign or subordination on disturbance agreements. Anything that is dent that is lease related, it's important that we, re we have that in hand and we review them. Yeah, and keeping that together, it, it's a good point. So many doctors just sign it, send it back, and forget to ask for a, a countersigned document. Which, right, if it's not if it's not back, really, you've agreed to it. The landlord has it. The landlord can sign it any time. But if you don't have something back, 
right? What was the final document? What is the governing document today? Um, for goals, Scott, as you're talking with doctors, as you're having your first conversations, what are some of the questions or, or really what are you trying to ascertain from the doctor to get well, a good sense of practice and career goals? Yeah. So, I mean, number one, I want to know if they're happy where they are. Um, you know, I, I'm, assu I'm always assuming that most dentists want to stay at their current space and renew. It's not always the case. Uh, I also find out, you know, figure out what their ultimate transition plans are, right? Are, are you planning on working another three years and then selling, or are you going to be there for 20 plus years? Uh, it helps me kind of come up with our strategy in terms of how we're going to deal with the, with the landlord. You know, I mean, it's, it's just important to really understand, you know, what your client wants. So you can try to obviously meet their goals. I mean, that is the key. Um, and then kind of, you know, I'll kind of tie on this pie chart, number two to number five, you know, once we've had that initial conversation, there'll probably be another conversation with the client where we discuss the strategy and how we're going to try to achieve what they're looking for. And in between that, numbers three and four on this chart, I mean, we obviously review the office lease for whatever risks are in there, the most, you know, the major points, the major concerns. And we do prepare ourselves as well with the, with the market research. So we want to understand, you know, what type of property, you know, the client is in, a retail property, what the vacancies are within the property, vacancies in the immediate area, what asking rents are, you know, perhaps what some recent lease rates were in terms of what was negotiated at the property or, or close by. Perfect. And then really looking beyond that, you know, what, what's really, really telling and, and please doctors don't do this is come off the, the webinar as we wrap up and suddenly, you know, skip sections one to five. And the first thing you do is pick up the phone and call the landlord and say, Mr. Landlord, I just saw Scott's webinar. How much do you want to charge me? And, and jump right into those financial lease negotiations. Right. Don't forget, landlords do this all day, every day. Right. For many of them, this is all they do. Right. They don't place implants. Right. They don't do any endodontic dentistry. Uh, all their core focus is just focusing on negotiating the dental office lease. So even the smallest bits of information that you share can be used against you through the negotiation. So I always suggest have a full plan. Right. Have a full negotiation treatment plan, quite frankly long before you've even picked up the phone with the landlord. You want to think of that as a carefully choreographed game of chess. And trust me, even before Scott even gets introduced to the landlord, he's thought of the 27 different ways this can go and where the duck and weave and move is, right, to the counter move from the landlord. Right? And the process could easily be two months, two years, two weeks, right? It could be a 30, 40, 60 plus hour file hopefully not 60 hours, right? That uh, gets Scott and I a little more gray, but really helps to reinforce how important it is and more importantly to be done right until the, the client's uh, you know, enthusiastic and satisfied and believes that it's a fair deal. Perfect. So uh, again, Q and A is open for those. I know there's some uh, great additional ones that have just come through. Uh, as many of you have requested uh, in appreciation of everyone's time, we waive the fee for a critical dates and risk analysis. So. Uh, if you have had any glimmer of concern or challenge or just curiosity, quite frankly, we will waive the fees and do a full analysis of the lease. We'll schedule this with myself and one of the members of the consulting team to just have a conversation about life, right? A negotiation treatment plan, if you will. Uh, get a good review. We'll pull all the local real estate reports, as we mentioned. We also create demographic data that can be very helpful. Uh, I can assure you it'll be one of the best hours you spend on the business side of your practice. So uh, highly encourage, if you haven't yet already or through the registration process, or even if you have, just for good, good measure, click yes. That'll give us the opportunity to make sure that we can get your original lease document, as well as any amendments, riders, exhibits, estoppels, et cetera, as Scott mentioned, right? We'll then do right, a high level review of the existing lease and we can do it via Zoom or via phone call, uh, again, on a complimentary basis to just, if nothing else, make you aware of some of the risks within the lease. And then also talk about some of the realistic wins that could be done. Now, everything's unique and obviously Right? We don't have the, the exact crystal ball. And quite frankly, every doctor's goal is unique. And quite frankly, when things go well, as Scott will attest, suddenly the doctor's expectations goes up a little bit versus where it was in the beginning. 
that's okay, right? It's human nature to always want a little more. Uh, but really to understand it, because look, this is your second largest expense after overhead. And it is your duty to yourself, your staff, your family, your patients, to make sure that no different than your wills and estate planning, your lease is properly structured aligned to yourself. And again, for all of you that own your own real estate as well, right? All of this is equally as applicable because many is a high likelihood that will retain ownership of your building and sell the practice separately, right? For many buyers, right? Don't want the million dollar practice plus a million dollar building. Right? that many will want to buy the building, but after five or 10 years. So having a well-structured lease, right, as an arm's length between your two different corporations can be invaluable, great for taxes, good for liability, right? And certainly value of practice, value of the, uh, the building as well, right? So all very, very important. Um, so really from, from that perspective, another question that came through here is, uh, let's see, so, one, one question here, Scott, if someone doesn't have the signed lease or updates, right, do you suggest reaching out to the landlord for copies or are they available elsewhere? Is there an obligation for them to give you copies? So what do you do in those cases that says, Scott, yeah. this is all so, I have? Yeah, no, so I will say probably half of the new clients that I work for uh, who, are, who, who have retained us to work on a lease renewal don't have all their documentation or haven't sent that out, out to us, which is understandable, especially, again, if you've been at a property for years and you have you know, four lease renewals plus the original lease. So generally in that situation, um, the doctor would reach out directly to the landlord, not negotiating a thing, just simply saying, I'm doing some housekeeping. I'd like to, you know, if you don't mind, if you could send over copies of my signed leases to me. Uh, I can honestly say I've never had a landlord deny the tenant the request. Sometimes it takes two or three phone calls to get the landlord's attention, but ultimately it's never been an issue. Um, there's no obligation for the landlord to give you copies, but frankly, why wouldn't they, right? They, they'll, they'll always do that. And like I said, it just might take a little bit of time, but you know, I've, I've never had a situation where the client where, where our, you know, the dentist has not been successful doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great point. If you don't have it, you should, and it can be a simple email. Quite frankly, it goes through to their admin that usually pulls it off their, you know, their shared drive and emails that out quickly. So just emailing the landlord to say, you know, I'm updating my records. Can you please send me a digital copy of my original lease as well as right, any any renewals? And they'll typically send it back to you as a very you know, compressed package and also good to compare to see what they think is the governing lease versus what you may have in your records. But that is a great place to start. And especially if there's any ambiguity as to did I renew it? Shoot, Scott, I don't know if I did exercise it properly. It said that I needed to send it via Raven when the moon was aligned with Venus, right? To send my renewal notice. Uh, I don't know. It's a great, um, to do it skillfully, but even just simply asking without any details, just asking for a digital copy, right? Just to make sure you've got it handy and close by. Yep. Perfect, great. Well, I see, uh, Dr. Severance, I see we are right on time and some great questions through here. Uh, Scott, fantastic. Great, Thank great you. information. Dr. Severance, any, any additional questions that might have uh, popped up or that we might have missed? Uh, I think we're good, but it, it always is, amazes me. As dentists, we think about, you know, losing function of our hands or sight or other things that could end our career. But after listening to several stories that you've given over the webinars, it's really many factors. This could essentially end your career in dentistry by signing the wrong lease or something going wrong that makes it not av available. So incredible service you guys offer. Scott, thanks so much for sharing the 20 years experience of everything you've gone through. I'm sure dentistry is a, a very unique profession that you've uh, acclimated to as well. But Absolutely. I think one of the first things you said early on is we're the, one of the most favorable tenants and I remember that early on when Howard Fran 30 years ago was going against Burger King, trying to lease the corner spot and they went with him. So uh, I think it continues uh, in all the great things you said about the uh, profession. So I wanna thank both of you for continuing to give great information to dentists uh, on this aspect and many, many more. So thank you for joining us tonight. And I would encourage everybody to click that right side of your screen where it says schedule a complimentary
uh, personalized lease consultation. Doesn't hurt and it can only help as you've seen and heard throughout the night. We did record this, so I just want to make sure everybody get an email and we've maintained the attendance throughout the program, so great job of keeping the interest. But everybody will get a, a notification of the recording. When we end this, there will be a survey if you can respond regarding the uh, accountability of tonight and anything else you want to see that Henry Shen can offer you. We want to deliver what you need to do your business and your profession correctly. With that, I'll thank everybody for the, tonight's opportunity and the attendance and wish you all a good evening. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Have a good night. Thanks, Scott.